there's no video at the moment because it's count time, like I said. Yeah, nah, you good, man. I understand. I already know. You told me it was count time before. I really just wanted to go ahead and uh, get you on, man, and talk to you, man. I ain't get to talk to you for a minute. Yeah, no problem. Yeah, man. So uh, I figured I could go ahead and um, I could even ask you some questions and stuff, you know, because I'm not going to lie. A lot of information is circulating still. Um, but how have things been for you over there, Gary? What's the latest news? Um if you want to fill everybody in on your status, because there has been some good news. Yeah, the, the, it's getting there. I mean, they've agreed uh, to fly me back to Toronto. So now I'm just waiting to find out the date they bought the airplane ticket. So they're supposed to let me know by Wednesday what day I'm flying out of here. So the good thing is that at least they're flying me back home instead of being just driving me to the border. Yeah. Exactly. No, nah, man, that's cool. Um, yeah. The least you got that. You know what I mean? I because before it was how are you going to get there. That was a big issue. Yeah, yeah um, that was a big issue. But luckily, between medical and my lawyers, they've been pushing them to, to spend the money to fly me to that side of Canada. Because I'm only a couple hours away from British Columbia, and, but I have no one in British Columbia to pick me up. So. Cool. At least flying me to Toronto, at least I'll have some support there and people to pick me up. Good. Well, besides this chat, Gary, I'm going to try to set up another video chat for, I would love to do tomorrow, but I'm going to be on the road. So I want to set it up for Tuesday. Yeah. What? If you can't do video chat today, I guess Tuesday. Yeah, Tuesday will be good. And yo, how does when can you do the video chat typically? Just before count? What's the best time for that? The best time is between uh, like six in the morning here till ten o'clock. Okay, good. Uh, after breakfast is over, uh, breakfast is over by six, so then every, everybody's asleep until like count time at ten o'clock. And then after lunch, it gets busy. So if it can't be done before 10, it has to be done between like 11 and 12. Okay, cool. No, well, we're going to set it up because I do want to have another video chat with you. Man. I love having the video chats and asking a lot of these questions. But, yo, I'm a, since we don't have the video, there are a lot of people, Gary, that just have not heard a lot of our earlier chats. Man, they just have no idea. So I'm going to ask some of these questions again, Gary. And, you know, just go ahead and... uh. You know, asking the best. But, Gary, tell more about your upbringing. Where were you born and raised? Uh, I was uh, born, of course, in Montreal. And uh, I spent about a year in Montreal. I lived up north in a town called Big Camo, Quebec. And uh, there I lived for about seven years. It's sort of a French town, but my parents were English. And then from there, we moved to Calgary, spent a couple of years there, and then a couple of years in Vancouver after that. And then after that, about three or four years in the United States before I settled down in, in Toronto. Okay, cool. Well, that's well explained. Now, your love for technology, where did it start? What did you say? Your love for technology, anything IT-related, technology-related, where did that love first start? Well, it started when I was growing up. But originally, I started in the 70s uh, with uh, train sets and model model cars. Because uh, that was the thing back in the 70s. Computers didn't really exist too much. But my dad was a, was a top uh, chief engineer for large corporations like Reynolds Aluminum and Pratt and & Whitney and, and Tuck Tape and Johnson Johnson, so he had access to computers before most people did. So at one point, he brought a, a huge computer home and put it in our basement. And I was about 10 years old at the time. And then they said, we're going to figure out how to program this thing, otherwise I'll be able to get a job. Because my day, we just had slide rules and and uh, drafting tables. Now we have to do everything by computer. So at 10, I started figuring out how to program computers. <laughs> and that's basically went from there. Uh, originally, 
when I was in computers at first, I was interested in music because I was taking classical music in school and computers could play music. So I, a lot of my early uh, development was on the sound of computers. And I, I got involved in the text instrument a lot because I it was one of the first computers that had a good sound system and also had speed synthesizing where it could actually talk to, uh, to you, which was unheard of back in the day. Mm -hmm. I just kept going from there. <laughs> now, Texas Instruments, tell us a little about that because it seems like a lot of people in the Texas Instruments world seem to be familiar with you. Why is that? Yeah. Give us a little background on that. Well, Texas was one of the first home computers that were manufactured in the late 70s, starting in 1978. And it sold millions of machines up until it was canceled uh, in 1983. It was one of the first products that was basically canceled during the, uh, the computer crash in 83. There was a technology crash in 83 where almost every company went into business and there was a lot of people left behind they were called orphans because the company was gone but they had the equipment so by 83 i had already was very well versed in technology uh, i already owned the tech system system myself mm. so i started producing software for it and uh from there it grew on to more third-party support. I started manufacturing hardware for it, uh, new video cards, new memory cards. Uh, I was producing a lot of different products for it and helping a lot of companies also doing third-party support. Nice. And in the process of doing that, uh, I actually got rights to the operating system and continued improving the system. So that was my main passion and where I made originally my, my money and my fortune during the years and mm. from there uh, I started cooperation in, in the 90s where we were doing interactive kiosks and, and various other products okay dang man so is it, I, I might as well call you OG Gary because you know <laughs> if, if, if you learned all that by 83 when I was born I'm going to just call you OG alright we just going <laughs> to that's what you is to me alright so, uh, yo, I got some good ones, and these are some that um, were out there. But, you know, so I wrote, I think I wrote you around the original letter. I think it was around last year sometime, right? Um, uh, around June of last year. Yeah, around June of last year. When you received that letter, Gary, were you surprised? Were you like... Who the hell? Was it a shock? I know you lived a celebrity life, but were you a little surprised? Uh, a little bit. Um, I'd been contacted once other, one other time by someone else in the podcast business, and we exchanged a few emails, and uh, and he sent me some books, but then he dropped off the, the radio. I haven't heard from him for a long time, so... Mm. Well, at least, you know, it's good that he did reach out at some point. You know, I it's better than people who didn't reach out. You know what I mean? And at least could provide some sort of support because I was one of those that I felt like it was nasty work on Nintendo's end from the beginning. You know what I mean? So that was kind of a lot of it then, working with Team Executor. And that was kind of a lot of the reason why I decided to write you and see how things were and see if I could provide any help. But, um... You know, that kind of answered another question was about anyone else that contacted you. Because I, I know we spoke about this, but others have not heard. It was one of the questions that came up in the video. But let's ask this, Gary, one thing. Have you ever had anybody physically come to the jail to visit you? Like, just walk in there. I'm here to see Gary. No, uh, I never had any physical visits yet. Uh, when I was in C-Tech, it was hard anyway. Only people that could have physically visit me if, if they were allowed to would be direct blood relatives and uh, no one would have didn't want to fly down all the way to visit me like that okay. uh, here at ICE it's a little bit easier to get visits but again of course um, I don't really know anybody in the Washington state and I don't think anybody is going to spend the time uh, flying down to visit me uh, but at least here at ICE, we could do video visits where we couldn't do that before in CTEC. 
Cool. No. So uh, when we started talking, Gary, did you ever think we'd still be talking? Like, did you think we'd still be talking now? Most likely. Good. Uh, I don't see no reason why we, we would stop. Yeah, you know what I mean. And I've been cool. And I ain't going to lie, Gary. I'm calling you OG from now on, OG Gary. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Just so everybody know on the, on, the, on the podcast, man, you OG right now. But um, so, Gary, I spoke to you a few days ago. Now, I know I didn't get any of this, but now that I'm going to be posting this, uh, we spoke a few days ago about all the articles that picked up your story. And I explained to you, like, man, this is new to me. I haven't had this. But you gave a story about you being in a store and a newspaper. Can you give that story one more time just so people can understand how, how I felt at the time when I thought I was doing something? Right? Well, back in the day, this is when I was involved in the flexibility like world. Uh, there was no real internet back then. Everything was done with uh, monthly magazines. Uh, your articles, reviews would come out of a monthly magazine. And uh, they'd be sold at bookstores. And uh, that's also how we did business, too. How people bought our products. We would place ads in magazines. And people would do it by mail order, where they'd actually uh, send you a check in the mail. You would deposit the check, wait till it clears, and you send them the product. So it was old school. Everything was slow. So when I was waiting to see reviews of my products and stuff out there, I'd be waiting for the next month's issue and see what they said. Or we did computer shows uh, where we actually traveled to shows and, and showcased the products. There'd be reviews of those shows in the next month magazine. So one time I was in the bookstore flipping through all the magazines because I knew it was going to be published in one of them. And the guy came up to me and said, hey, you can't be reading all the magazines. And I said, no problem. I'm gonna, uh, when I find my name, then I'm going to buy the magazine. And sure enough, eventually I found my article that I was looking for. And I said, hey, I want proof that it's your name. So I showed him my driving license. After that, I bought the copy and... and uh, that was it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that is a. I'm not gonna lie, Gary. It's not too many people that could do that, man. That's why I just wanted you to tell that, just to walk. Yo, um, I don't know about you, Gary. I, my nuts might got a little bigger right after that. Like if I walked out knowing that my name was in there, I told him my name was gonna be in there, and it was in there, and he's like, "Oh, I, I'm sure that was an amazing moment, man." You know. <laughs> You know, we all can't be superstars like you, man, you know. But nonetheless, uh, Gary, I know one of the big things that was talked about when all these different publications were covering the story, a lot of them heard $14.5 million settlement. Um, How was that? How did they come to that amount? Was there something that made that amount just go astronomical? Was there per incidence? What was it that made it get to fourteen point five million? That's nuts. Uh, the way they came out with the the amount uh, was uh, Nintendo had experts uh, that testified about the amount of damage that they they uh, suffered and how they came out with the the damage figure, or what they call the intended loss, is that they estimated out of all the Nintendo Switches sold, which at the time there was 85 million Switches sold, they estimated, now of course everybody hacks the system, so as a small estimate, they said 500,000 was hacked, which was on the low end of the estimate scale. And out of the 500,000 that got hacked, where experts testified that on average uh, most people when they buy a, a video game system buy the top 10 video games like Mario Party, Zelda, stuff like that but when a system is hacked they don't buy the top 10 games they buy only uh, of course this is the statistical analyst uh, 2.41 less games so instead of buying 10 games, they buy maybe eight games or seven games. So then they take that 500,000 times their estimated number, 2.41, and 
times the retail value of the games, which is fifty nine ninety nine, equals around like seventy two million, which is the intended loss. So then my share of it, based on uh, the number of co defendants and the indictment, yeah. would come to four and a half million. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Now that man, right. you broke it down perfectly. That. You know what I'm saying? Makes sense. Now, of course, that's nasty work. And them percentages, ah, that's so mad. But, you know, they they do have people who do that math, who do crash those, you know, it is stats. Um, And all they had to do was prove, right, their losses. They were just trying to prove their losses. Now, you know, that, that is an astronomical number. I think we all can agree across the board. Um, What were some of the things, because I know this is something you mentioned before, but what were some of the things that you and your defense team had in the back pocket, just in case? Like, just in case we got to do this, I might just let them know. Uh, well, the, there wasn't too much else. Uh, we were looking at, uh, at, at talking about my history of my Texas men and, and various other stuff. Some of it came up in court. But uh, we decided not to go into uh, how well schooled I was and how well educated and how well successful I was, because that would have just probably most likely made the judge give me even more time than I already got. So that was one thing we left out. But other than that, there wasn't too much else we could do. Uh, All right. No, I mean... um... And that's just interesting. I always want to try to put myself, you know, in your shoes to like, like I've been in jail before. I've been in jail for a, I ain't going to say a stint like you. I ain't did one of your OG stints, Gary. I ain't did one of yours. And I ain't going to say because it's going to go public too, but I was in there for a little bit of time. Let's just say a short, short, a day. Let's just say a day, right? Even though it was more than a day and a lot went down, but let's just say a day. And, um... It was, I was in county, very different from what I hear from federal prison. What have you heard, or what do you know as any of those differences? Was there something in the federal prison that you had to deal with, or something that was better, that typically people out here in county prisons don't know about or should know about, you know? Or how was it? Was it like they need to change stuff there? Was it an okay state? Tell us more about that state for those two and a half years. I experienced a little bit of county jail because I was, uh, when I first got arrested uh, at, at the Newark airport, they took me to the nearest county jail, which was in Essex County. And that was uh, my first experience of being inside a jail. And that was, that was crazy there. Uh, uh, it was, I was the only white person in, in the jail. Uh, there was about 20 cells of inmates there. And I was put into one of the what quieter pods they called it. Uh, people doing two years or less in the county jail, but everybody was in there for assault and uh, stabbings and things. And there was usually a fight every day. Someone always getting beaten up. Uh, but luckily, I was only there for five weeks. Yeah. After that, I uh, was in CTEC. And uh, the federal jail is not too bad. It's it's different, uh, but there's a lot more politics there. Uh, everything is divided by race. Okay. Uh, being a white person, I had to sit only with the white white people. And while I was there, uh, we were dealing with the Capitol riot. So most of the people that I was associating with in the federal prison were all people that had been uh, similar to the Capitol right and stuff. There was Proud Boys there, Aaron and Brothers, Bikers, stuff like that. So while I was on pretrial, I was dealing with all the white supremacist people. So it was a little hard because I'm not a racist type of person. And I couldn't talk to the blacks. I couldn't talk to the Hispanic people at all. I couldn't even do business with them or trade with them or nothing. So it was, it was a little tough, but uh, because of my age, the bikers, uh, all angels, took a liking to me, and yeah. they always made sure I I had the food I needed 
coffee Good. and Good. access to the phone. Good. Uh, so I basically sat at their table and mm -hmm. they, they kept they all out for me while I was on tree trial. Once they got sentenced, it was more relaxed uh, because we were in the worker unit and I had a job in education. So everybody got along with everybody. There was no politics, no uh, race stuff anymore because yeah. everybody had a job and they, and they knew when their exit date and there was no more stress about how many years they're going to be. Yeah. So it was more, the last year was a lot more uh, relaxed. Plus it kept me more busy because I was working every day. Mm -hmm. Now that was well explained and a lot of people don't understand those politics. I'm glad you broke it down. You are right. It is broken down to race and people don't understand the importance of such little things when you're there. Like, you know, having somebody to sit with protection, like it ain't just protection. You need somebody to watch you and you might help watch them as well, but at least you got somebody. People don't understand how needed that is. And that's why you said the Hells Angels taking a liking to you. I'm like, I, you know, right with you. All right. Sit down. Right. Because my black ass would be sitting right with the black folks. You know what I mean? And it's it's sad that it's like that. But we know it is politics and we would be talking. But you're right. During the daytime when we out, you got to sit where you sit. And you know what? That That's crazy. But I'm glad you broke that down. Um County, man, I'm glad you got out of county because I ain't going to lie, Gary. That's where I was at the whole time. It was fights every day, man. I've seen people bringing in drugs. I've seen people get stomped out. I've seen uh, nine people stomp on a guy. I've seen a 50-year-old guy have a pack of cigarettes like nothing. You know what I mean? Just bring, bringing them out. I'm like, what the hell is count? So I'm glad you got out of county, man. So, um, Gary... When you get back to Toronto, you, you mentioned you have friends and things that um, you'll be able to use for help. What would you like for me to say to anybody that if they had any interview request or anything to speak with you? Because I'm definitely Gary want the plug on the first one. All right. I want the plug on the first one. But I know there are a lot of individuals and I, I know one specifically. Shout out Ernesto at Torn Freak, who I've been speaking with closely, who who would love to sit down with you once you're out. Um, is there anything you want me to say to them? Tell them. Um, and I'm paying you for my interview too, just so they all know, all right? So I'm paying. So y'all need to pay my man too. Okay, but anything you want me to, uh, you know, let them know. No, uh, there's nothing really to know, except uh, uh, once I'm back in Toronto, it's going to take me probably a, at least a week or two to get uh, my phone and internet and back up and running at least uh, temporarily. Uh, I have a friend of mine looking right now to find see where the cheapest place is they can rent. And then once they get back to Toronto, I'm going to have to apply to the government to get welfare right away so I at least have some money in my pocket True. so I can at least get some clothes and mm -hmm. and have some food and then we'll, in that cheap place work on getting a better place and a job you're right man that's right. what most important thing most important. but for doing interviews and stuff i'm perfectly open but for the first couple months i'm not gonna be able to travel i'll be stuck in toronto ah, so good. if somebody wants to interview me they're gonna have to be done valid zoom or or come physically to, to meet me okay cool i like that and hey, you know what gary you you might be playing i might be in toronto when you get out don't I'm I'm not too far from Canada right now, okay. You no, know, I used to uh, uh, when I uh, well, I was heavily in the Texas world. I actually used to travel to Chicago on a monthly basis to yeah. their computer meetings and stuff. And that's where we used to have some of our big uh, uh, fairs where I yep. showcase my uh, uh, wares. Uh, uh, I used to go to almost every year to the big Chicago fair. And in fact, the Texas Instrument Fair is still going on once a year in Chicago. Yeah. A bunch of old timers like ourselves that are still alive. <laughs> <laughs> Yo, you know the old timers run it, man. They run all that. We got to get out of there when they come around. You know what I mean? So, uh, but no, I'm glad you mentioned that. And, and Gary, that is something I'm, I would love to do as well. Um, believe it or not, I have not been out the country. Uh, I have my passport, something I've been wanting to do. Uh, wife's been trying to drag me to do. And 
what better way to start, right, than a simple trip to Canada? Like, it's right there. That's nowhere, you know? Yeah. And then I could actually sit down with you. We could talk. I could be able to, yo, Gary, ah, what's up, you know? Uh, that would be nice, man. So hopefully we can do that when you get out. But I, I agree. You need to get settled. And anything I can help get settled, you know, anybody else want to donate? I do have the link there, Gary. No one has donated. I don't know why they're doing this. But I'm putting it out here right now and saying it, that people need to donate and help you out because you need that help, man. I can't be the only one with the donations of the MoFan podcast. Also, just donate. Like, we can't be the only ones. You know what I mean? So, um, other than that, Gary, man, I, I asked all the questions I got, man. Yo, so since we talking about anything, do you watch boxing? Say? Do you watch boxing at all? Well, sometimes, yeah. yeah. There, there uh, was a big fight on yes. Do you know anything about that fight? No, uh, they, no one here watches the boxing. Uh, uh, most of the TVs here, the, the people are watching the either soccer or, or basketball. Uh, and you right, soccer. I know soccer's going on right now. It's popping, and then basketball, the playoffs is pretty yeah. big right now. Man, I ain't going to lie there. I'm all into basketball, so I'm right with you. Are they killing you with the Spanish soaps yet? I know them. the Telemundo be rocking in there. Man. I ain't going to lie. Them soaps be good. All right, but uh, you got to understand Spanish. Yeah, that's true. It's a good thing as I do because in the pod that I'm in now, there's like 38 people here, and that's about only three or four that know a little bit of English, so. It helps so they can mix with the uh, Hispanic people, no problems. Nice. Gary, I'm at that. How many languages do you speak? Uh, basically only two right now. English and Spanish. My uh, okay. my French is very rusty. I haven't used it since I was seven years old. Okay. So, All right. No, that's good, man, to have both. I, my you know. uh, brain is filled up with computer languages instead. <laughs> <laughs> Yo, computer like I'm gonna tell you. So there was a buddy. I ain't gonna say his name, but all right. But you told me to reach out to him, and the guy wrote back. And when I, I kid you not, Gary, the response was the whole entire Texas Instruments world watched you talk. That's good. That's good. I still have a lot of respect out there. I mean, I have a few haters, but. Uh, uh, and there's been there was some bad blood back in the, in the day. At some point, I I didn't weren't able to produce the amount of products that people were demanding, so there was some problem uh, back then. But most people have forgotten about that or or moved on. There's so many new things in the world that Thanks. everybody went into business problems at one point or another. No, you're but, right. It is way more things to worry about and. You know, we got a minute left, you know, so yeah. this is the, you know, goodbyes and everything. But, Gary, I'm going to set up another video chat. Um, right now, I'm, I'm away from home, out of town, but I'm, I'm closer to Canada, you know. <laughs> but uh, I'm going to be driving back. And once I drive back, I'm going to set up our video chat for Tuesday morning. So that way we can have the video chat early morning. Okay, sounds good. All right, Gary, I'll talk to you later, man. There we go. So, my bill, $5.88. Woo! Boy, they charging. They charging for that thing. Yo, I could have pulled up. I wanted to pull up the, the whole thing. But anyways, you know what I mean? Um, let's pull it off some. There we go. That's better. Yo, I, I need a little light, too, man. Yo, did y'all hear that? My man, Gary, speaking some facts. My man said they broke down the judgment that said that Nintendo <laughs> Switch owners typically buy the top 10 Switch games. And if they modify their system, they're le less likely to buy those 10 games. On average, a person that would buy 10 games modifies their system and now buys eight. But they don't count all the stuff like the consoles. They buy multiple consoles. Do you count that? You know what I mean? And those multiple consoles count to the inflated number. Like, that's crazy. Crazy. But anyway, man, it's your boy, Nick Motosol 5. I'm about to roll out. 
Um, like I said, I'm out of town, man. So, you know, how you do your point, bro? I'll let you point.